Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Grow New York Food and Agriculture Summit and the Bending Not Breaking Food and Beverage Startup Resilience and Adaptability Panel. My name is Chris Gerling, and I'm a Senior Extension Associate with the Cornell Craft Beverage Institute at Cornell Agritech in Geneva, New York. This panel is going to cover many of our favorite corporate buzzwords, innovation, the legendary pivot, keeping your head in a swivel, etc. I think we can sometimes think of innovation as a luxury. It's something that only Silicon Valley startups or the richest corporations are able to afford. But as you'll hear today, innovation, or maybe you can use the word adaptability, flexibility, resilience, if that sounds more approachable, it's not a luxury, it's a necessity. When I spoke with each of our panelists today to prepare for the session, they, said, they each said something along the lines of adapt or die. To be clear, I think our panelists will tell you that they had pretty successful years and given the circumstances, extraordinary ones. But filling your parking lot with bottling lines or managing a network of dairy farms with cows that, don't, that can't do a two week uh, shutdown is not for the faint of heart. So enough of what I have to say, let's meet our panelists. Uh, Sonia? Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Sonia Del Perel. I'm the general manager at Nine Pin Cider Works in Albany, New York. Uh, after spending about a decade teaching and another three decades practicing law, about seven years ago, I hit the jackpot when my son uh, came to me uh, and uh, offered me uh, to assist him in his passion for all things Apple. And so we combined his considerable talent in the art and science of cider making with my business experience and legal compliance experience, and we formed Nine Pin Cider Works. Thank you. Thank you, Sonia. Kevin? <clears throat> Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Kevin Ellis. Uh, I grew up on a dairy farm just south of Syracuse in a small town called Tully. Um, I got my bachelor's of science degree at Cornell University. Um, and through some twists and turns in, uh, in animal nutrition and banking, um, I've landed a job here at Cayuga Marketing and Cayuga Milk Ingredients as the CEO. I've uh, been here for 12 years. We, um, we created a farmer co-op of just over 30 members and about 1.4 billion pounds of milk sold per annum. And um, I, had the, uh, I had the luxury of starting up a company in 2014 called Cuga Milk Ingredients. And we're a, um, a global provider of milk-based ingredients, uh, all the way from milk protein isolates used in sports nutrition to uh, standardized milk powders that are sold for um, infant formula um, manufacturing around the world. So thank you. Thank you, Kevin. And finally, Jason. My name is Jason Barrett. I'm the president and founder and master distiller of Black Button Distilling. I founded it eight years ago uh, to combine my passion of making uh, locally crafted whiskey uh, with a desire to work for myself. Uh, so at this point, we have 63 team members uh, who operate our stills uh, in Rochester, New York. And uh, we distribute in 14 states, export to Japan, and... Um, and are just looking to make good whiskey, as well as some vodka and gin. <laughs> of course, of course. Uh, thanks, Jason. All right, so now we've met our panelists. Um, in the next few minutes, I'm going to have each of them kind of basically give a, a report on how they spent their year. Uh, not exactly that, but a little bit. Uh, that's what we're going to talk about in terms of the challenges they faced and how they, uh, how they met those challenges, how they overcame those challenges, how they pivoted to face those challenges. I'd like to remind the audience that if you have questions for the panelists, share them in the chat box that you see to the right of the screen, and we will take a look at them and address them uh, as possible throughout the panel. So with that, um, Jason, let's start with you. Uh, we, can, we can zoom back to uh, mid-March 2020 um, and how your uh, business uh, was operating and, and what you did from there. So take it away. Yeah. So 2020 was going to be Black Button's breakout year. Uh, we had beefed up our marketing and our production in 2019, uh, built up quite a stockpile of inventory in the warehouse uh, because we were having we had renewed launches uh, in our four major markets where we were going to be hiring outside salespeople and, and making a, a true push outside of New York. Uh, that was all scheduled to start April 1st. 
So we actually had 14 job offers out to sales reps uh, on March 10th when the governor called for uh, businesses to consider voluntarily closing. So we had to rescind those offers, uh, which is never ideal. We had spent a lot of time and money trying to get these folks to come work for us, and we were unable to complete that. Um, and we started shutting the factory down because, unfortunately, fermentation, you know, our organisms are alive. We can't just walk out and not come back. So in doing that shutdown process and, and fear, being fearful of what the world had coming, it became very clear that my staff and I were, we were not well positioned um, to not be working. Um, and at the same time, we were then hearing that you could make hand sanitizer out of ethanol. Um, so we got a recipe from the FDA that was very clear. You can only do this, this, and this, but if you do these things and sign up on this website, you don't have to take six months to get your hand sanitizer approved. You can be in business as soon as you register. So through some political contacts, we connected with a local hospital and they simply said, how much can you make and how fast? So we took the cider, or sorry, we took the ethanol we had on hand. We made 5,000 bottles of hand sanitizer. We delivered it, you know, a week later, they were thrilled. And then word got out that we had the ability to make hand sanitizer and the orders just started to pour in. And I mean, we, we were talking to hospital administrators across New York, in Wisconsin, in Detroit, and they all simply said, how much can you make and how fast? So we started calling other contacts we had. Uh, we asked wineries to lend us their bottling lines. We asked bartenders to become bottlers. We bought ethanol um, from anybody that had it in any tank that could be transported to our site. Um, and over the course of the next 14 weeks, our team uh, made 400,000 bottles of hand sanitizer. And to put that into perspective, we only made 100,000 bottles of liquor in all of 2019. And there's two bottles of vodka in every bottle of hand sanitizer. And these are full 24 ounce, 400 hand wash bottles. Um, and it was really a crazy combination of things coming together. And, you know, each week or each minute, it was just about finding the next hurdle and finding a way to overcome that. Because at first it was, where do we get the ethanol? And then it was, where do we get the hydrogen peroxide? And then it was, okay, folks don't really like our glass bottles and they're very expensive. Is there a plastic bottle? And we eventually found a coffee syrup flavoring company that made their own plastic bottles about 40 minutes from us. They had shut down because there wasn't a need for their coffee flavoring syrup as the world was cascading down. And they went into production making bottles, delivering them direct to us. Now the problem is they had never sold the bottles to anyone before. They had always just used them internally. So what should they charge us? How do we pack them? How do we move them? You know, we get two or three weeks in and all of a sudden we don't have enough water. And that's a weird thing in a, in a first world country to be saying we don't have enough water to do this. But the FDA required that it be sterile water. And although we have reverse osmosis, a reverse osmosis plant in our, our uh, factory, it's very small. You know, we're, we only need like 100 gallons a day. And now we needed 2,000 gallons a day. And a machine to really do that is half a million dollars. So we ended up connecting with Genesee Brewing Company, and they actually would use their technology, prep the water, and we were now shuttling water across the city of Rochester so that we had the right water to use for the product. Meanwhile, we had hooked up with a local delivery company that had 28 trucks, and at one point we had 20 of those 28 trucks working just for us because as people would pay for their orders and the pallets would leave, I mean, these things were being delivered at two in the morning and nine o'clock the next morning. I mean, they would drive through the night to get these things to where they needed to go. And, you know, luckily we very early on decided to do just one size at one price in one format. If you wanted, you, you could buy a pallet or you could buy a case. 
And that was it because, you know, people would call up, well, I, I don't want 900 bottles. I want 1100. Well, I don't have time to adjust your palate. There's no, there's no palate with your name on it in the plant. You know, we're making a palate every 42 minutes. So you can come pick the, this one up at 225. And it wasn't even just in time delivery. It was down to the hour delivery because as trucks would take product at the 2 PM shift, um, they would bring in the supplies for the next shift. And it was just incredible to watch our team step up and everyone to really take the bull by the horns, you know, young assistant distillers became shift captains working 10 hour days, six days a week so that we could run the plant 20 hours a day and have someone actually watch over the equipment at night because we were literally bottling in the parking lots because we only have a 5,000 square foot space. There wasn't time to move and there wasn't time to, to do anything else. So I give our team a lot of credit for ramping it up and just as quickly ramping it back down. Because on July, I, at, on July 28th at 1.30 in the afternoon was the last order we got. And it, it just as quickly it, is, it had started and everybody needed it, now all of a sudden everyone had hand sanitizer and there was no need for our product. So we went and did a hard shift back into liquor because luckily we had carried those 14 weeks with the um, inventory in our warehouse, but we were now almost out. And if we were running our customers out, our core business could suffer. So we're still catching up from that. Meanwhile, we, um, we donated $100,000 worth of product to a local food bank and the United Way to distribute because we wanted everyone in Western New York to have access to the hand sanitizer regardless of their ability to pay. And actually just two weeks ago, we donated another 7,000 bottles uh, to the Board of Elections here in New York so that if people went and were voting in person, they could do it safely because this wasn't just about keeping our employees working and doing good for our community. It was really about trying to keep everybody safe and trying to keep these numbers down in New York State. Um, at the end of the day, uh, across those 14 weeks, it was 397 million hand washes. And now we're just back to making booze. So it's been quite, quite the year. A roller coaster ride, indeed. Yes. Thanks, Jason, for that for that introduction, that overview. And I think people will digest some of the magnitude of what he just mentioned. And I think some of it'll hit you maybe even later tonight when you start thinking about. It. Did he say? Yeah. Um, so yeah. So thanks, Jason. Um, so then we're gonna we're gonna now go to Kevin, who's gonna talk about how he spent his year uh, in milk and milk ingredients. Thanks, Chris. Um, our story is nowhere near ex as exciting as the as the last one for sure. But um, we um, we entered 2020 um, coming into our sixth year of of doing business. So we were a, a startup company, and I always tell people um, most startup companies have the luxury of starting small and scaling up. Um, the mere fact that we are owned by farmers. Um, we started up as a $140 million company um, and 72 employees. So out of the box, we had to have, um, you know, all of the, all of the things a large company needs and didn't have the luxury of time. So it, it took a while to get um, our business stabilized, as you can imagine. Um, 2020 was going to be our real turnaround year. Um, in effect, it has been, um, but it hasn't come easy. Um, we um, we entered into 2020 and things were smooth up until about March. Um, March is when the stay-at-home orders started to take effect um, and actually started to take effect around the world because we are a, a, an export company. And um, we saw in, in the month of March – uh, an insatiable desire for dairy products. Um, we, um, we simply couldn't make enough. Some of our orders increased 300%. Um, and then, and as you know, if you know cows at all, cows make about the same amount of milk every day. So we were, we were in a, a state of panic trying to figure out how to get milk to our customers and dairy products and our finished products to our customers 
um, as they were ordering them, and it just turned into an impossible task. Um, that was immediately followed by um, a almost immediate decrease in orders to the same magnitude. Um, just as an example, just in the um, in the Northeast Corridor, um, there were over 2,000 tractor trailer loads of milk that were dumped, whether in, in fields or in manure pits. And we were struggling uh, to try to figure out what to do um, with, um, with the milk. And what drove that primarily was in our industry, 50% of the dairy products sold are into food service and 50% are normally into the retail trade. Um, the shutdown changed that in an instant. So what we saw was now 20% of the dairy products were going into, re or into food service and 80% had switched to retail. Well, the problem with our industry is it was geared, geared up to supply a 50-50 product mix, not a 2080. Um, so what we saw was at the same time we were dumping milk in manure pits, um, we had limits in grocery stores on how many jugs of milk you could buy, um, how many packs of cheese you could buy, how many butter packs you could buy, because there wasn't enough retail packaging equipment available to make the switch uh, as fast as the pandemic uh, had wanted. Um, we had felt the brunt of that. We have customers that were in the food service sector. Um, we had to pivot quickly um, because all of a sudden we went from contractually uh, having to have an obligation to sell to um, spending a lot of time looking at our force majeure clauses. We had customers that were trying to back out of uh, contracts uh, due to force majeure, um, which means um, in, in, in layman's terms, it means they were unable to perform, so they wanted out of their contracts, and it's a, it's a contractual language in that. One of the things that we did really quickly, having the ability to switch to international shipments is we – we moved more of our goods to the international market where um, our products were going into retail products in other countries. Um, our biggest marketplace that uh, we service is Southeast Asia, um, the likes of Malaysia, Indonesia, Philippines, um, some Japan, a little bit into Vietnam. Um, we went from 30% of our sales there to 60% in a matter of a month. And we've stayed there. The other thing that we did, we own our own manufacturing plant, so we, we figured out how to get more throughput through our factory. And since April, we've been running at 98% capacity. And that's theoretical capacity. So I would argue that we've been running 100% capacity uh, since the beginning of April. And, um, you know, we, um, We've never missed a day. We run seven days a week, 365 days a year, because that's that's how the cows produce milk. That's how we run. Um, I give my team a lot of credit. Everybody shows up to work every day. Um, they're engaged. They know how important it is that we need to feed the world. Um, and um, the other thing that we uh, have done is we've really focused on higher end product and moving more of our production into uh, beverage applications and infant formula applications and uh, uh, ultra filtered milk applications in order to um, continue to add value to our products even through this pandemic and add insult to injury. Um, we had already decided to execute on an expansion project this year. So we've been executing on a, an expansion project during COVID while dealing with the shift in consumer demand, and it's added um, a lot more pressure to my team. So I, um, I've been trying to take care of them um, with some extra bonuses, and um, we definitely have hired some extra cleaning to be done to the plant so that um, we can um, keep COVID out. So um, it's been a it's been a challenge. It's been fun. Um, Long story short is we're having our best year ever. Um, and um, we've only done it because we've been able to pivot, um, been able to service uh, more retail customers on a global basis. And, um, and we have a great, excellent team um, behind us to do that. So um, that's our story.
So thanks, Chris. Cool. Thank you, Kevin. It's great. Yeah. So two, two kind of whirlwind tours. Two people who uh, who had good years. I think they would say from their bottom line perspective, but not because it was easy in any uh, way, shape, or form. <laughs> All right. Next, uh, we'll have Sonia talk about uh, maybe less dramatic, but still uh, as much uh, resourcefulness required to operate a cidery in New York State. So our uh, 2020 started off with uh, an actual uh, threat that had nothing to do with COVID, and that was a uh, market threat that um, had been developing over the course of 2019. Um, which was the uh, introduction into the market, um, especially with the, sort of the big Bev players um, of the hard seltzer craze. And this was um, uh, a hard seltzer is a sort of a low calorie, uh, low alcohol content drink that sort of, you know, just came onto the market uh, and was really taking over. Um, it's taking over beer, take, taking over uh, cider space, and uh, so this was a this was our pre-COVID challenge, um, and we decided that we needed to um, stay true to our mission, which was to support New York agriculture by uh, you know um, producing quality craft ciders. Uh, and what we decided to do, and I have uh, uh, the first slide here is, uh, um, would be appropriate now to show the audience. Uh, what we decided to do was use a, um, a, a, a production um, method that harkens back to colonial times um, when they, would, uh, they uh, produced a product called Ciderkin, um, where they would use the mash left over from the first pressing of the apples and they would add water to it. Uh, and they uh, would, would come up with a, very, a lower alcohol <laughs> content. It was often served to children when the water sources were um, impure in those days. And so there would, you know, there would, it, it, would, it was still a fermented product. So it would kill uh, some of the bacteria in the water. Um, so we came up with uh, this line of what we call light ciders, um, and the idea was it was low-cal ciders from uh, local farms. So we were able to come onto the market with our version of a, a low-calorie, low-alcohol beverage that was still based uh, in New York agriculture and um, local farms from our region. And so this was our answer to that particular uh, pre-COVID market challenge. Then, um, when uh, <laughs> then in uh, March, then the biggest challenge of our, our seven-year career um, hit, and uh, you know, uh, first there was uh, the the shutdown, and so. Our, you know, our, you know, we had both as a we're a New York farm cidery, and we have both um, a wholesale business where we service uh, other bars and restaurants um, and uh, grocery stores and wine and liquor stores, um, and but we also have our own tasting room where we have a retail service. Um, so our tasting room was shut, and our the percentage is was roughly about seventy percent wholesale and thirty percent retail. So our tasting room was shut down, um, and uh, the uh, um, you know uh, that that was a shock to our system, but also our wholesale business. Uh, was threatened seriously because the all of the um, the bars and restaurants that we served were also shut down. Um, that luckily, um, you know, uh, in June uh, we were able to slow, you know slowly reopen. And what uh, what helped us tremendously at that point was this uh, expansion of outdoor dining. 
Um, and I'd like to move to the second second slide. Now we are located in a in a uh, industrial area in Albany, so there's nothing um, elegant about it. <laughs> but what we what, uh, the city of Albany. Uh, along with the um, state uh, allowing this outdoor expansion, they gave us part of our street. And um, we tried to create a little urban orchard here. Uh, we uh, planted our uh, apple trees in these uh, industrial totes. And um, we made a little garden area with our urban orchard there and tents. And this uh, expansion area uh, allowed us to sort of recreate a, uh, a a tasting room, um, and we did very, very well in the warm in the warm uh, months, and uh, were able to recoup the lost revenue from the shutdown of the tasting room there. The other thing that happened um, uh, after the shutdown, about two, maybe three weeks after the shutdown, is that New York State, which had previously um, uh, previously uh, direct shipment of cider to consumers was illegal. Thank you for uh, shifting the slide there. It was illegal in New York State. So we were not allowed to direct ship cider, but I think as a, we had been working as part of the uh, New York Cider Association, we had been working, uh, trying to pass legislation to achieve that right. And I think that the um, governor's office uh, recognized that with the shutdown, uh, that it was going to be very important uh, for cideries, uh, large and small um, and mid-sized, to in order to survive the shutdown, to um, have this alternative source of revenue. So in March, um, about two weeks after the shutdown, uh, under an executive order, we were given the privilege uh, to direct ship. And what we did was we, uh, we were able to, um, you know, I think being somewhat small, you, we were able to pivot. It was, it was a little hectic because you can't just, uh, you know, put alcohol in a package and mail it. You have to um, get a license, special license with either FedEx or UPS. That took a couple of weeks. And we had to learn how to become shippers. And we had to repurpose our employees who are used to being, you know, behind a bar and working with the public into being, you know, basically packagers and shippers. Um, some of them, you know, some of them didn't really particularly like being repurposed. We thought we were doing the right thing by keeping them employed. Um, and that was a, uh, an interesting experience as an employer. Uh, dealing with employees that weren't particularly thrilled with the the new jobs, um, but uh, we were able to, you know, at least keep our employees employed this way. And so we, you know, we had to shut things down and rebuild a new business, a new business model, uh, and a, a new department, a shipping department. Um, so uh, we were able between the outdoor expansion and the shipping department, uh, we were able to, um, you know, we realized that we were going to survive the challenge of COVID. Uh, our uh, our um, percentages changed, the, the wholesale, uh, you know, uh, uh, business um, diminished, the retail business actually increased um, this year. Uh, we are, not quite on par with our revenue from 2019, but we know that we're going to make it. Um, and uh, it has been quite the ride. <laughs> That's our story. Thanks, Sonia. <laughs> <laughs> yes, all of you are quite right. Um, you know, I just congratulate all of you for, you know, for your resourcefulness, for your ingenuity, and for, you know, for all of you feeling a sense of responsibility to your employees and to, to making sure that, you know, to, to first and foremost, trying to keep them employed and, and occupied during this time, I think that's admirable that you all did that. And um, I hope that more businesses can, can do that as, as the situation evolves. And so I don't know if I want to ask this question. We have a number of questions from the audience that are great questions and ones that I was thinking about. Um, 
I won't drop that one on you guys yet. <laughs> the first, the, the one that, that just came in is a little scary, but uh, let's start out with um, starting with. Uh, We'll go Jason, then uh, Sonia, then Kevin. Um, your, uh, what have you learned from this experience that uh, you're going to take with you, no matter how the, the, how the uh, environment uh, is back to quote-unquote normal or, or a new normal uh, going forward? What do you think, uh, what do you think is the, the primary take-home uh, lesson for you? I mean, I think what was so critical to us being able to do this pivot and um, and be so successful was that we have we we empower our employees a lot during normal times. They we really have a very decentralized decision making process, and people, you know, we we encourage them to act independently, make their own decisions, and move forward with what they believe is right. And that was the only way, you know, divide and conquer was the only way to achieve all of the things we were doing uh, during this crazy time. You know, I, I couldn't, you know, I had to trust that the accounting guys could keep the money moving in and out and that the sales guys were booking orders and we were helping to create some process around that. But they then had to go and each do their individual piece because there just wasn't time to keep everyone on the same page. Um, and that trust is again the only way we could do it so i i i don't know that i was as aware of that before um all of this and i'm very thankful that our team has that great um i think i would say it's kind of general it's a general lesson but i think i would say that that business in business it's really no different that on the theme of resilience and adaptability, that business is no different than any other aspect of life and living. And that the basic thing is that you've got, you've got to seize the moment and you have to rise to the occasion. And uh, you, you've got to, you know, you've just got to deep breathe and, 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 put one step in front of the next and, and, you know, you have to rise to the occasion. So. Great. Very inspirational. <laughs> Kevin. Yeah. For, for me, um, uh, hold everything loosely. Uh, I remember we developed a, a pretty solid business plan, uh, how we were going to make the business successful. And, um, we went through construction and we started up the business plan was basically put on a shelf and collected dust. It didn't, it didn't apply anymore because the dynamics in the world had shifted. Everything had changed. Um, so you have to, you have to be flexible in business and look for opportunities that fit your capabilities. So, so for me, it's always being on the lookout of where, uh, where can we meet a need what are we good at? Where can we meet a need and be willing to, to pivot quickly? So uh, COVID just did that in a short time frame. Now, normally you have a little bit more time to think about it than two weeks. Mm -hmm. So that's, uh, that's what we learned. Yeah. And I think Kevin, I think you were talking about how you're, you're much kind of more, I wouldn't say suspicious, but you're, you're more agnostic about any one customer now, right? I think trusting any one uh, source, any one client uh, now, you know, feels a little bit, uh, you seem like you want to be much more flexible and much more uh, broad reaching in, in your, in your scope. Is that true? Uh, so I have a, I have a, I have a rule I live by now that no more than 25% of our sales are ever going to go to more than one customer, no matter how attractive it is, because uh, you know, when you, when you get into a situation where you're fighting over force majeure clauses, um, I would really hate that person on the other end of the phone to be 60% of my sales. So yes, diversification of, uh, of cash flow and risk. Yeah. Sounds good. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Um, so we have, I think, uh, people maybe from out of state who are wondering about operating in New York state. And so their question is about the tax and regulation environment in New York state. And I would say, first of all, you know, I'm not obviously uh, a business person, but from my perspective, those are two very different questions, taxes and regulations, um, and how they apply in New York. Um, so, uh, 
Sonia, do you want to start off uh, your opinion of, of taxes and regulations uh, in New York? I think and this is for, for somebody who's considering uh, starting up here. And I'd like to hear all three of your perspectives because of the differences in how you your businesses operate. So, Sure. Um, I mean, for craft beverage, the uh, regulatory environment has changed tremendously uh, in the last 10 years or so. Um, and it, for the positive, it, it, uh, it has uh, significantly improved. And um, there have been, um, uh, you know, there's been a movement toward making it a lot easier. Um, generally, there, New York has a reputation of being a very difficult state from a regulatory um, perspective. Um, there are, it's also, it, it, it all, there's, and there are also reasons for that. It's, uh, it's, it's a lot of the regular, for instance, the environmental regulations are um, stricter, but safer. Um, so it depends on the industry that you're in. Um, so each industry, it's, it's hard to talk about this in very general terms because each, each type of industry um, you know, has its own perspective when it comes to regulation. Um, but I can say from the craft beverage point of view that this is a, uh, has, uh, this environment has become much easier, you know, over the last 10 years. Um, and I would say also uh, from a tax uh, point of view as well, it's getting better from a, a craft beverage point of view. Um. Let's, Kevin, uh, I mean, Jason, you can chim chime in, I guess, if you have any uh, additions or corrections, but you're kind of coming from the same perspective as Sonia, I think. Um, I mean, the, the one interesting difference, I actually lived in Washington, D.C. when I decided I wanted to do this and moved back to New York because of the favorable tax and regulatory scenario for my business. Um, distilling is the redheaded stepchild of liquor, um, you know, Cider is seen as virtuous and beer people, you know, hardworking people drink beer and sophisticated people drink wine and only scoundrels and pirates drink rum and whiskey. Um, so we were not well accepted in the Maryland, D.C., Virginia area at that time. Um, I've, for the most part, found the city and state to be fairly amenable. They, they have certainly regulations that need to be complied with but I've actually usually found our partners on the other side of the table to be proactive. Yeah, they're, they're still um, government employees. You know, I don't, they're not going out of their way to, to make it easier, but I've never felt like they were, um, like they were looking to jam us up. They just have rules and those rules need to be followed. And it's our, our job as business people to find out to figure out how to craft our business such that we can follow those laws and hopefully make a profit. Sometimes. <laughs> they want you to make a profit. They want you to pay taxes, right? Because that's, that's what they're looking for is the, you know, the revenue. Yes. The, that's the federal level, especially. Yeah. Uh, you know, so Kevin, you, you're, you're in a different, uh, different kind of industry than, than uh, Jason and Sonia. What's your perspective on, on the environment in New York state? I really, I really need, so Chris, I need to segment this because uh, we did a construction project from, from a green field, which was a corn field we grew out of. Um, and then there's the regulatory environment to deal with that. And then there's a regulatory environment to deal with an ongoing business. Um, you know, we're a highly regulated industry um, because we're food and uh, we have oversight from New York state ag and markets Um on the state level, then we also are overseen by the Food and Drug Administration and the United States Department of Agriculture. And finally, uh, Homeland Security is now part of our regulatory environment uh, because of food safety. Um, on an ongoing business, um, I would say the regulatory environment is fine. I mean, we have a good relationship, open relationship with um, New York State Ag and Markets. Um, we have had to deal with the Department of, Department of Environmental Conservation a few times um, with some concerns on the site. Um, we've developed a working relationship with them. So I would say regulatory wise, that's fine. 
Um, it was during our construction phase. It was, and I put it, this in my chat box. It was incredibly difficult to construct a new facility. Um, and I, it may have been some of that was the, the work had not been done yet to make this a shovel ready site that we were coming to. Um, but we had to deal with um, multiple layers of government, local, city, state. Um, we had to deal with the DEC, the DOT, uh, SHPO, which is the historic preservation people in New York. And they do an archaeological dig for Indian artifacts. Um, we had to remove a gas well. We had to deal, you know, it's just the list went on. So I would caution anybody to think they can build a business from scratch in New York State quickly. Um, to think again, it takes time and resiliency to be able to do that. Um, unless you can truly find a shovel ready site to develop in the state of New York. Um, but uh, certainly there's there's regulation. And then on the tax side, I mean, that's, that's pretty transparent. Um, there's no secrets there of how New York state taxes its residents. We have um, fairly high real estate taxes. We have high income taxes and, and, you know, you, you, you have to want to be a New Yorker, I would say. Well put. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. That's what, I mean, I could add my two cents to all this is I, I think it really depends on what kind of in, industry you're, you're trying to enter into from the regulatory perspective. Um, and then, you know, where you're going to do that in New York state and, and what you're comparing it to, what your frame of reference is, because depending on the industry and the location, I think that can make things a lot easier or more difficult, you know, from us on the, on the craft beverage perspective, you know, I think our state is, is among the leaders in terms of being innovative and accepting of craft beverage industries. And that's why we have so many distilleries, cideries, wineries, and breweries. Uh, we have, you know, we are at or near the top uh, for all of those categories. And I think there's a reason for that is that the state has realized that there's a, there's a benefit uh, to them. And I think in most agricultural, uh, uh, context, the state is also very supportive. Now, I know from my work that what you might hear from the DEC in Yates County, New York, uh, down on Cuca Lake versus what you might hear down in uh, Suffolk County on Long Island are, are very going to be different because there's just different uh, atmospheres, right? There are different residents, different concerns. And so, so even within the state, it can be different. So I think it's hard to give one answer to all that, but uh, I thank the panel for, for their perspective on that. Um, so the, the question that I was saving, but I guess we can we can go to now, um, is there is lots of talk uh, about a second shutdown. Um, and while we were conducting this panel, I just got a text saying that my daughter will be returning from school uh, a little earlier for, for uh, Thanksgiving break because her school is about to go virtual for a little extra time. Uh, they were in person and they're about to serve. So it's, it's, it's happening. We're hearing about increasing cases. And um, if... Uh, all of you, I guess we'll start with Kevin. You've been going third, so you go first on this question. Um, what if, if there is a second shutdown, uh, how do you think that might affect your business or, or how you might operate? Uh, my, so, so it's a good question, Chris. I, I'm still operating um, as if we're still in pivot mode. So um, I think we'll have a, it'll be a, a limited effect on us. Um, what I do see, if this happens all over again, you're going to see people running to their grocery stores and stocking their shelves again. And um, I won't be so quick to try to respond to customers that have a need because um, I think we learned through the, the previous one that it, it's short lived. Um, and I, I just think the, you know, it's kind of old hat for people. You may get a little run up in that, but I don't think for us, it's, it's, it's still going to, it's still going to be business as usual for us. Um, I pivoted and I didn't pivot back. So we're going to stay the course. Yeah. I think that sounds like a lot, a lot of people are still saying in New York, especially, I think we're still like, what do you mean? A second shutdown. We're still operating, I think in a very, uh, limited basis and have been for these months. Jason, I don't think you'll probably will return to the sanitizer business. Uh. <laughs> so unfortunately there's been, so there were 11 recipe changes over the course of this year from that FDA document. And unfortunately with the latest round of changes and increased uh, reporting requirements, as well as the decreased demand, given that Purell and the, the normal suppliers really have 
for the most part, stabilized. Um, we won't be going back into hand sanitizer. Um, we're also still trying to dig out of the hole that we created, you know, to, to lose 14 weeks of production and then uh, to be trying to make that up you know, it will, will be well into 2021 before we're back on track. So right now we're just trying to make the products that we need to ship to our customers on a daily basis. Um, but as you might guess with the, the barrels behind me, um, that, you know, we, we haven't made whiskey to lay down into a barrel since March. So at some point I got to start doing that again, or six years from now, there's not going to be anything to drink. Um, and we will get our feet back under us. You know, if, if we have to close the plant, that will obviously delay that. Um, our sales force can work remotely. Our accounting force can work remotely. Um, if the liquor stores stay open, I'm sure we'll still be delivering to them. So there's a little too many puts and takes on, on what it could be. Um, it's the macro changes that, that worry me, you know, our, you know, I am not concerned about whether people are going to drink alcohol, but are they going to spend the extra dollars for a handcrafted locally made product? Or are they going to reach for the, the larger size of a national brand? Um, and we'll just have to see. Great. Thank you, Sonia. Uh, it sounds like we were talking, we were talking earlier about how the weather is probably going to be a big factor in, in terms of your customer, uh, um, attendance and, and, and your, your, your ability to operate kind of on your retail space. Um, you know, how do you, how do you foresee the next couple of months going? Yeah, well, we, um, uh, have been, um, you know, we decided that we were going to sell, uh, experiences in that little area that you saw on the slide for the winter campfire experiences. Um, you know, we looked up the, the regulation um, in the city about uh, having outdoor fires. And um, we realized that in that space, we could have uh, little fire pits. And so we've been selling um, uh, campfire experiences for uh, groups of six people, um, you know, on a scheduled reservation basis. If we're shut down, we've already said that if, you know, that these are um, you know, we'll just have to have like rain dates, snow dates to when we, when we can reopen again. Um, so that's sort of how we had, uh, thought about getting through some of the, the colder, the colder days anyway. Um, but, um, you know, we are working, uh, as part of the New York Cider Association to, um, get, uh, legislation passed for permanent uh, direct shipping rights, not just for cider, but I think that uh, the push is going to be um, for all craft beverages to be able to direct ship to consumers. There's, um, you know, wine has that right in New York State, and it's really time for all craft beverages to have that uh, that legal right. Um, doesn't seem to be much of a threat to uh, COVID has taught. The, uh, the distributors a lesson in this regard that it it hasn't really been a threat to their uh, distribution businesses and um, uh, you know I think it's time that uh, that uh, some of the, the you know the these uh, the smaller um, distiller distilleries and cideries and uh, even breweries if they can figure out a way to you know to to sh ship beer um, safely keep it cold et cetera um to to have that privilege and so um i you know i think uh you know this uh, there is pending le legislation and and i think it's uh that's something that we would like to to see happen and so um that is one way to to, to try to ride this ride that ride out another shutdown um delivery and takeout uh is another way and that has was another privilege that was given and so we can we can as a you know as a retail storefront we can do delivery and takeout um, as well so that that would uh, that serves as a substitute for a revenue source great thank you all right um, 
we'll see if we have time for more questions. We have one more question here. I'm going to get Kevin to answer this first. Kevin has, was very gracious to give us his time, and he has a board meeting that is going to begin in a few minutes, so we'll see uh, how long we can hold on to him. So um, I'll start with you with the last question, or at least maybe the second to last question. Um, a question about labor challenges pre-COVID and impact on your workforce from COVID. Uh, how, how, is your, how has it been to, to find workers uh, before and then during this, this uh, pandemic? Uh, this is a good question. This has been a huge challenge for, for us. We, um, uh, we've constantly been challenged by finding skilled laborers. Um, we don't, we don't pay anybody minimum wage. We have nobody making minimum wage. I think our minimum pay rate is 15 or $16. So we, we do have a challenge finding skilled laborers. The biggest challenge that we had a number of, um, months ago was, was finding industrial mechanics, um, I think our guidance counselors and schools have done a fantastic job telling people that they have to go get a four-year degree. And we have a huge void of skilled people who can fix things, um, whether it's electricians, plumbers, HVAC people. There's a huge, um, huge problem. We started our own apprenticeship program. I hired a local um, educator from our local BOCES full-time. She is now work doing workforce development for us, um, recruitment and um, apprenticeship. So we now we have, I think we have six apprentices on staff. She's working with them. She's developing them into um, uh, different skilled positions. And I continue to have problems, even during COVID with the unemployment rates, I could not attract people to join our company. Um, I think part of the problem was there was uh, federal and state unemployment benefits that uh, made it unattractive to have to go to work. So I have, I've actually struggled all the way through COVID, even though I need more employees uh, to find, to attract them. Um, and I still struggle today. I don't, I don't know. I don't know what else to do. So. <laughs> I, yeah. I mean, that's something I've, in the 10 years I've been in this role, um, you know, we've been talking about like, if you can, if you are a, a tech Technician or a mechanic who can work on like a packaging line, a bottling line, a packaging, any kind of packaging line, and you like and the machinery and the programming like that. You can name your own price and go wherever you want because there's just nobody who can do that. That's that's been something that has been a huge void. Is is that kind of level of, uh, yeah, and the people who can do it really well are all retiring. So that's that's been a challenge. Actually, Kevin, one more comment. If you have a second, well, you mentioned uh, when we talked earlier that you know, you're actually, you know, you hear a lot of companies are, are scaling back in R&D and you are about to scale up in R&D. Is that true? That's, uh, yeah, that's, I think that's gonna be our future because the question came up from the audience, what's the environment like in New York? Um, we compete around the world and I can tell you, I know for a fact that New York is not the cheapest place to do business. So we need to innovate to find ways to add value to what our farmers do which is produce milk and they produce high quality milk and it's good milk, but we need to find ways to uh, enhance that value. We will never make it in business if we are trying to compete with the low cost companies in the world. So um, we have made the strategic decision to invest in innovation. So I'm scaling up R and D as, as we speak. So I've hired uh, two people, uh, to work full-time in R&D for me, and um, that will just continue. Um, that's, where my, that's where my thinking is at. Um, we want to we wanna stay viable long-term, and uh, to do that, we need to be innovative and specialized. Great. Thank you so much. That's exactly what I wanted <laughs> you to say. So perfect. Yes. Um, Sonia and Jason, uh, if you'd like to just go back to the, to the labor question and talk about uh, your, uh, your experiences. You just want to play. You know, uh, we, we've been very fortunate to um, have had, uh, you know, we have some very long-term employees that have stuck it out with us even through COVID. Um, we did have employees, as I said, I think I mentioned earlier that uh, once repurposed, um, they weren't they weren't happy, uh, and they moved on. Um, but we didn't have any problems um, uh, finding replacements. So uh, we um, uh, we you know we 
we've been able to um, uh, always have a pool of, of applicants. Um, we, uh, in terms of adding value, you know, hard cider is a value add to New York Ag. Um, we pay a, um, um, a very a good market value price for apples that would otherwise um, either go to waste or be sold uh, under value to juice, juice companies. So um, I, I'm very proud of the fact of the role that we play in uh, New York agriculture because we, we end up uh, adding value uh, to um, New York, um, the New York apple industry. So. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, one thing I was thinking about is your location. You're, you're in like Albany, New York. We're very close to the city uh, where Kevin is in a place uh, in terms of your location, uh, in terms of access to labor, that also probably plays a role. Um, all right. We're getting about to our, down to our last couple of minutes here. Jason, uh, you have any quick comments on labor? Uh, just that one of the things we learned, especially for our production guys, is that we actually do a work with day as the final step of the uh, application process. Because a lot of people say they'd like to make whiskey for a living, but when they spend a whole day on their feet, on the concrete, wet, covered in muck, but yeah, you know, and then we do their interview at five o'clock, we often find it wasn't what they had in mind and they're not ready for it. We, um, we've been very fortunate that we have long-term tenure in the people that, uh, that stay. We also uh, pay above the prevailing wage for our industry, which is above our, you know, our average. But, um, but finding the right people is always a business challenge. Thanks, Jason. I'd like to just take one more opportunity to thank our panelists for their time, their perspective, uh, their heartfelt comments. Uh, we really appreciate all of you uh, going through what has been a very tumultuous year and a very challenging one for all of you I know. Um, and it's just very, uh, very so appreciate that you guys would share these lessons that you've learned. Um, and so really uh, appreciative once more. Uh, so next up, we're gonna have networking for those of you who wanna stay around. We have some small group conversations about craft beverages, upcycling, and startup food businesses. So you can have a chat about the things you heard during this or any of the panels today. To join, you're going to go back to the lobby and click on the networking nook where you can join the conversation on the topic that most interests you. I will be on the, in the room on craft beverages. Thanks again to our panelists, uh, and thanks to our audience for your attention, and we will talk to you soon.